From 4 o'clock in the early morning hours of Sunday, Rehana Khan and her daughter Ifat Khan had been standing and staring at the magnificent Charity Twin Towers. The Charity Twin Towers had been constructed on the same ground that Rehana and her daughter Ifat, along with thousands of the poorest of the poor, and the untouchables, had called home. Uncounted numbers of street children and beggars kept them company. For the destitute, the daybreak marked the dawn of an historical day. Today, the Twin Towers are going to open their doors to receive the orphaned and homeless children of Mumbai. The Charity Twin Towers had been built by an anonymous American family to provide sanctuary for these unfortunate Indian children. The benevolent American family had named the two towers, the Mahatma Gandhi Institute for Orphaned Children. Since the inauguration is only scheduled at noon, some of the attendees have decided to go to their places of worship and offer thanksgivings to their gods. Not far from the towers, there are scores of Muslim mosques and Hindu temples, and a single Christian church. In India, a person's religious affiliation is prominently announced by their name or their outward appearance. In case of women, their clothes reveal not only their religious affiliation but their social status as well. The exception, of course, are the poorest of the poor and the untouchables who lack the option of choice, and have to make do with discards. They have no addresses and their slums have neither name nor number. They have nothing to identify them except their human genre. Sometimes other species are more distinguishable than they are. Like many other beggars, Rehana and her daughter Ifat left the huge crowd and headed to their place of worship to offer prayers of thanks for the Twin Towers. It took them a couple of hours to come out of the huge crowd, pass through the many Hindu mandirs and Muslim masjids, to reach the only Christian ecclesia in the biggest slum area of Mumbai, which called Dharavi. Dharavi would be correctly called a large open public washroom. People, old and young, urinate and defecate openly in the streets. Therefore, human refuse scattered everywhere amidst strewn household garbage and discarded items no longer worth salvaging. Human excrement was all around, some fresh and some crusty and dry. While walking, the person literally had to hop over piles of excrement to move forward. The open gutters, which were commonplace, emitted a nauseous smell that did not seem to bother the local residents. As if they were all of them immunized against that noxious and disease airborne foul odor. You need to navigate the dark alley punctured with slivers of sunlight, bending over to avoid hitting the low roofs of the shawls. The distance between one row of shawls and the other would hardly allow two people to walk abreast. Between every row of shawls was usual gutter filled with sewage from the shawls themselves. Sewer systems and cisterns were non-existent. Every shawl with an open door opened up to children and their parents stuffed into an incredibly small area. You would wonder how the children could remain alive and not fall seriously ill and die in those filthy and unhealthy pockets of human habitation. The gigantic charity twin towers were standing like two great palaces of a Maharaja and his Maharani in the midst of those millions of shawls. Or, they were also like two skyscrapers in the middle of millions of slums. At last, the dream of Rehana's daughter, the slum girl, Ifat Khan had come true. Although, some followers of Mahound had tried to prevent the construction of the towers, they could not kill that noble dream. Many years before, the Children of Darkness planted five bombs, destroyed the construction, and killed hundreds of workers and their babies. Nevertheless, the noble dream remained in the mind and heart of the former Miss World, Aphrodite Krishna Khan. Now after many years a wealthy American woman, eventually succeeded in bringing her noble project into the real world. No one knew the real name of the benevolent woman. Through her trustees, she built her noble twin towers. The world had soon forgotten about the child bride, the seven-year-old Indian slum girl, Ifat Khan who had been terribly abused by the seventy-year-old man of Arabia. Her tragic story, which had been written in a book and acted as a movie, is considered something of the past and no one remembered her anymore. Thousands upon thousands of female children had fallen victims into the hands of the same pedophiles and like Ifat Khan and suffer rape and abuse to this day with no one has doing anything. 
Child marriages are lawful and practiced in broad daylight in the religion of Islam after the example of the Prophet Muhammad and his child bride, Aisha bint Abu Bakr. For ten years, Christina, her husband Michael, her mother Rehana, and her two daughters, Aphrodite and Ifit went underground and hid themselves from the Muslim terrorists. Although the fear of Islamic retribution is always a lingering fear in their hearts, the family never abandoned their dream of building a shelter for the destitute. They took on all risks and built the gigantic charity Twin Towers for the poor children of Mumbai. During those ten years Ifat Khan became so rich that her bank balance exceeded a billion dollars. Following the wise advice of her loving husband, Michael Lewinsky, she started import and export business between India and America. Her business was so flourished that in a few years her millions of dollars multiplied until she became a billionaire woman. After her miraculous rescue, Christina Lewinsky decided to pay homage to her childhood name, Ifat Khan. She understood that all those years she was running away from her sad past and hiding behind many names and surnames such as Aphrodite Krishna Khan, Amrita Khan, Pooja Patel, Christina Lewinsky, Christina Fernandez, and Susan Johnson. She also was controlled by the fear of the demons of Islam who kept tracking and haunting her wherever she went. No matter what first names and last names she used to hide from them and no matter which place she went still they managed to find her and attempted to assassinate her. Their last assassination attempt was carried out under perfect and flawless plan. All perpetrators thought that only if she was in the Kabaristan, the cemetery, then she could escape their well-masterminded plot. One of them said sarcastically, even if she was in the grave we would dig her out and piss on her and burn her remains. When they kidnapped her they imprisoned her in their basement and tortured her day and night. She felt as if she was in the den of lions or cast in the fiery furnace. God closed the mouths of the lion and his lioness and extinguished their raging flames. Then, he sent his archangel Michael and snatched her from their claws at the right time. Yes, Michael was more than a husband and spiritual friend to Ifit. He was her guardian angel. He always appeared at the right moment and saved her life. When she was chased by the Somali terrorists and sought shelter in the Jewish home it was Michael who stopped her from killing herself and introduced her to God. When she was terribly abused by her selfish Christian husband and her Indian in-laws and became despair and suicidal it was Michael again who convinced her to walk out of that hellish marriage life. When her biological mother publicly betrayed and disowned her and she became mad and was left alone to die in a filthy mental hospital in Mumbai, Michael rescued her again. He also rescued her from the mouth of the lion, the terrible demon, Khalid Mansur al-Had, when she was imprisoned in Sudan. He took her through the valley of shadow of death in that scary jungle of south of Sudan. If it wasn't for Michael she would have been brutally murdered by those children of darkness who masqueraded themselves as protectors of the society through the law enforcement, but they were breakers of the law and dangerous terrorists. After their last assassination attempt which she miraculously escaped, if it correctly discerned it wasn't Michael but God who always used him to save her life. Her bitter experiences with those children of the devil, if had taught anything practical, she finally knew and understood there was nothing could protect her from their evil schemes except God. Therefore, she determined never again to run away from them or hide her true identity behind pseudo-names. She remembered the Lord's words which he spoke concerning those children of darkness, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell, Matthew 10, 28. Christina Lewinsky changed her name once and for all to Ifat Khan and convinced her husband to go back to his former angelic name Michael Lewinsky. On that historical day, after offering their prayers and attending the Sunday service, Rehana Khan and her daughter, Ifat Khan returned to their former home to continue to wait with other destitute for the inauguration of their charity institute, which consists of two identical twin towers. They were disguised as beggars among the destitute, waiting patiently for its hour of inauguration. Although, today she is still considerably wealthy, Ifat decided to come to the level of those poorest of poor and experience their suffering and agony. Her mother and she were once one of them. They lived and suffered like them. 
they were slum dwellers and poor of the poorest. If it could not remember her early years of her childhood very well when she was also one of the beggars of Dharavi since she left when she was merely seven. She left penniless, but God brought her back with a bank balance of over a billion dollars. She stripped herself of all her costly ornaments and expensive clothes. She put on sackcloths and rags and walked barefoot like them. Her fate in life took her from her family's slum that was made out of the discard boxes collected from the garbage containers of Dharavi and placed her in a cage made of pure gold. From the age of seven, she lived in richness and decked with gold and diamonds from head to toe. Nonetheless, she wished that her destiny had not taken her from among the poor to the rich and selfish men who used and terribly abused her. In remembering those years of suffering and abuse, Ifit's eyes began to shed hot tears in silence. She could do nothing to alter the course of her tragic past life. Finally, after her abuses, her life took a positive turn after her destiny took her to that Jewish home and she met the love of her life, Michael Lewinsky, the completed Jew. The man who changed her life from carnal to spiritual and remained her lover, friend, guardian angel and true husband ever since. She never knew the real meaning of life and the true love of man until God intervened and worked a miracle in her miserable life and her road crossed that of Michael Lewinsky. If it had never understood the meanings of the words, evil and good, until she forsook Islam and embraced Christianity. Before her conversion, she had no clear distinction between good and evil, right and wrong, truth and falsehood, and God and Satan. For very long time she lived among people who mistook evil for good, considered rape marriage, abuse enjoyment and draw pleasure from the suffering of innocent children. She was blind and living in darkness until God used Michael Lewinsky to open her eyes to the light. Today, she has the most loving life partner in the world and living the most happy family life with her loving daughters Aphrodite and Ifit, and her dear mother Rehana Khan. The media had a field day reporting on the humanitarian project for the poor of Mumbai. They reported on the construction of the two buildings, the benefit of new housing for poor residents and their children and the kitchen that allowed them access to free meals. The media was touched to hear that the benefactor was also going to provide for their education. According to her project plans, the schools were to be housed inside the buildings being constructed. The plans called for canteens serving nutritious food, laundry facilities and a cloth distribution facility, a small clinic and hospital, among other benefits. The poor and homeless children would be housed separately by gender. The girls would be accommodated in a separate building from the boys. No child would receive any money, because the Gondas, the gangsters of Mumbai underworld mafia, would rob it from them. The Mumbai Gondas throw hot boiled oil on the faces of homeless children to blind their eyes and disfigure their faces. Then, they send them to beg on the streets. Whatever money they collected would be taken away by those heartless thugs. Sometimes, they cut their hands or legs and force them to beg for them. Poor girls would be forced to work as prostitutes and whatever they earned would be taken from them. They only feed them and give them small huts to live in. Child abuse is an unheard of concept in India. Children as small as four and five years old go to work wherever they could find someone to employ them. Education of children is an option left for the parents to decide upon. Untold numbers of children in Mumbai are homeless. Those street children are easy prey for the Gondas. The children of the charity Twin Towers would instead be provided with free accommodations, food, clothing, medical attention, and education. The plans already called for a small private hospital in each building and for a small army of doctors and nurses to run them. Besides the schools and hospitals each tower housed a Christian church. If it and her husband knew that whatever they do for the children would be nothing if they don't provide for their salvation, Mark 8, 36. The two towers were built in the largest slum area in the world, Dharavi. Each tower was 17 stories high with 500 rooms, each housing whole families or children in bunk beds. The third floor was reserved for a church, a school, a hospital, and canteens. 
The first and second floors were designated for offices, shops, and a supermarket for businesses to rent. The rentals would be used to finance similar projects in other areas. If it had long-term plans calling for the construction of other similar charitable buildings. This first jewel in her crown would be called the Mahatma Gandhi Children's Shelter. The poor and streets children would be accommodated on all 14 floors. Access to certain floors and the children restricted to authorized personnel and the maidservants and men servants only. The men servants and maid servants were employed from Mumbai slums and shawls. The servants would be allowed to eat their meals in the restaurants without charge while working in the building. Likewise, they were all entitled to use the washrooms. In case of illness, they were also entitled to receive medical treatment and free medication. They would be allowed to enroll their children in the shelter's schools. There would be many security guards guarding the Charity Twin Towers day and night around the clock. The Charity Twin Towers included recreation facilities such as playgrounds for various sports, gyms, swimming pools, parks, etc. Although, India allowed child labour, the children of Mahatma Gandhi Children's Shelter would not be put to work with the exception of domestic chores. They would be taught and expected to care for their clothes, shoes, beddings, and other belongings. But, the older children would be taught how to bathe and take care of the younger ones or bathed by nannies. The children's clothes and other linens would be washed by washerwomen. The Charity Twin Towers had zero tolerance for bullying and other kinds of abuses. The two twin Charity Towers stand like giant skyscrapers among the millions of shawls and slums of that poverty-stricken area. On behalf of the unnamed American family, the Prime Minister of India is going to inaugurate the Mahatma Gandhi Shelter for Orphaned Children. It had cost the wealthy American family untold millions of dollars to fulfill their noble dream. If it Khan and her mother Rehana Khan continued to wait patiently among the beggars for the arrival of the Prime Minister of India. If it knew that her loving husband, Michael Lewinsky, and their lovely daughters, Aphrodite and if it would be watching the great event on the TV in their deluxe rooms at the Five Stars Oberoi Hotel.